virtual pavilion, space and geospatial pavilion, hosted from the KTN. And uh, we are going to talk about ideas of FAIR, which is standing for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, and how we incorporate that into the climate change services on different levels and aspects. Um, I'm representing OGC, this, the Open Geospot Consortium, which is a member organization, and we have the mission of exactly focusing on findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And in this case, we're talking about these aspects in climate. And we have plenty of other in, uh, in, uh, innovation programs or in, uh, uh, other programs ongoing. So this is just a short uh, um, example or some examples. I will put the, um, the, uh, the links later on in the chat so that you can check out the uh, information on all these projects, what we are involved in. And uh, I'm very welcoming you to reach out in case of you have any kind of, of questions further on. And this is now the agenda. We just in a second ago, we just changed it slightly because we will have the WMO and the last uh, presentation a bit more, more early. So this is the lineup. Then the beginning is from David Oranos, uh, from David Kuhr, from Oranos, uh, who is giving an introduction, just only kind of on a philosophical level on the, on the concepts of fair climate change services. And what is that about? We are meaning by that. We are standing behind. And then we are digging into the the details, into the technical details, and coming up with. Uh, a presentation given by Martina Stockhausen from the German Climate Computing Center about the data distribution centers in line with the IPCC. So in parallel to this session, the COP26 is taking place where all the negotiations are uh, in the inside and the IPCC is the one giving the appropriate information into, into that uh, frame or into that uh, decision makers and how that works technical level that this is maybe these are the the aspects about that and then we will have we're moving to the directly to the global level with that from the WMO so this is the change in the agenda and uh, seeing how that works uh, how the the, the UNFCCC climate uh, policy frames are being incorporated in that on that uh, on that level and uh, making focus on the global framework of climate services for example that I'm very much looking forward to that presentation. And from that then, going <coughs> uh, to the uh, Panicus services, and here we have two aspects presented by Angel um, Alos, Angel Lopez, as well as then from Vincent Henry Poich. And uh, we have two services being presented and also the aspects on the technical level, and then also how to deliver the appropriate information uh, coming from the Copernicus services. And by uh, all that, you will already see that we have a mixture between uh, numerical models and satellite images. And then <clears throat> we will have a special talk from Eduardo Pechoro from the European Space Agency. And <clears throat> here they are the climate change initiative with a clear uh, uh, focus on the UNFCCC, also tackling the policy frames. Uh, the international policy frame, so Paris Agreement, for example, and how that looks like then on a technical level, that will be a topic of that. With that, <clears throat> we are really we will have plenty of uh, things to discuss. So you will you are very much welcome of uh, putting all the uh, questions that you have into the chat and reaching out there. And then later on we will have a discussion on all the aspects that you are interested in. Well. We are limited by two hours, but we are uh, welcoming you to continue the discussion uh, in the tables uh, provided by KTN, as well as also in December, for example, there is an OGC member meeting with a special uh, climate session. And here you are also very much welcome to continue the, um, the discussion. That's the introduction from my side. And with that, I'm handing over to David. Uh, he is uh, giving you an introduction on uh, the climate there, the climate services. Okay, David, you are a presenter and the floor is yours. Thank you, Nils. So just to briefly introduce myself, I work as a climate service specialist at Uranus. Uranus is a 
regional climate consortium based in Montreal. And, and part of our job is to provide services for adaptation to climate change. And so I'd like to start the talk with a brief definition of uh, what are climate services. So climate services are a translation of historical observations and future climate projections into actionable information. And so in this example here, I'm showing a bridge over a road with a small stream flow. And the idea when you're building that bridge is you need to size the culvert, so the, the pipe under the bridge so that it doesn't wash away when there is a, an intense rainfall. And so the design value to decide the size of that, uh, of that culvert is based on the size of the upstream watershed and the intensity of rainfall. And if you base that value only on a historical rainfall, you might under or overestimate the risk of the bridge failing in the next 20 or 30 years. So basically choosing correctly that value for the size of that culvert is a climate service because you're integrating historical and future climate information into the decision that the engineer makes regarding the size of the infrastructure. And the question is, well, this this very simple example, imagine it's replicated thousands of times across roads, buildings, all kinds of infrastructures, some more exposed to climate than others. And then organizations like ours are tasked to deliver those climate services to decision makers, engineers, uh, planners, and, and so on. And the process, wherever you are in the world, pretty much looks the same. You start with data discovery and selection, so finding historical data, climate projections, and then you subset that data on the local scale you're interested in. So you subset and regrid that information. There's then a statistical step, so removing biases from climate projections. From there, you compute climate indicators. So in my example of a road culvert, you compute, for example, the annual maximum rainfall. And from those values of maximum annual rainfall coming from multiple future climate simulations, you, you make ensemble statistics and try to diagnose the uncertainty around those future values. And then you visualize your results, create statistics and tables, and so on. And the, the first step of that workflow, so data discovery and selection, is guided by principles called the FAIR data principles, where FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And the question we're asking ourselves is how do we apply the same kinds of principles, so that these FAIR principles, to the services that follow in this workflow? So how do you make a subsetting service actually FAIR? How do you make climate indicator services fair and so on? So you can all string them together to get at the results you want at the end. And it's not yet clear exactly, at least to me, what fair, the fair principle mean for climate services. And I, I, we can make informed guesses, but my sense is that we'll learn through experience what, what this entails. But as a first guess, my sense is that findable means that we have public catalogs of all those climate services available at multiple institutions. Accessible means that those services would be accessible to people with low bandwidth and low CPU and storage uh, access. Interoperable would mean that the standards for both the data inputs and the outputs of those services, as well as the definitions of the services themselves would all be based on standards, so international standards, community standards. And reusable would mean that the services themselves are hopefully based on open source software so they can be modified and adjusted over time, that they come with rich metadata describing what they're actually doing, and the carry provenance information so that when you look at an output, you know exactly what steps went into that output. And, and my sense is that the climate science community is already very well positioned to deliver those types of fair climate services. For one, there is wide agreement already on a common data format called the NetCDF format, which pretty much everyone in the climate community uses or knows how to use. And there's also a very strict metadata convention called the CF convention that uh, basically uh, tells people how to describe data in those NetCDF files. So it, it, different people 
describe in the same way uh, different data sets, so it's comparable. And there's also a shared infrastructure, so a, a software infrastructure called the Earth System Grid Federation that is used by climate scientists to archive climate data and, and get at it when you're a climate analyst like myself. And so, and, and this Earth System Grid Federation has already made efforts in the past to add certain types of services to the data infrastructure. So there's already thoughts around this, this idea. So I think we're in a good position to achieve that. And as you'll see in the following presentations, there's actually some stuff out there that exists and, and does that. And at my office on a very smaller scale, uh, we've built a kind of research platform for climate services where we have data servers for both climate data and geospatial data that speak with services for subsetting, by adjustment, and climate indicators, among others. And all these connections are made through OGC standards, so the web feature services, for example, or web processing services, so that uh, when we collaborate with other service providers in Europe or the States, we all agree on the same standards and we can interoperate or share our services among others. And then for users, it's also the same interface to learn, so I guess it makes things easier. Um, and my, my thoughts around this is that, well, building an advanced climate service infrastructure is not something one climate service center can do it alone. Uh, we really need to work at it as a community. There is just too much data and, and so many services to build that it's impossible to do on our own. So my call basically is for uh, a community effort, uh, something that, that Nils and I believe very strongly in. So we, we've uh, participated to the Birdhouse community now for a number of years. So this Birdhouse group is trying to um, collaborate on building this shared infrastructure for climate services. And if you're interested, uh, give Nils or myself a, a, a send us an email and we'll be happy to discuss collaboration ideas with you. And with that, Nils, I pass the buck back to you. Excellent. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, David. So, um, also for mentioning Birdhouse, so I just put the, the link into the chat so for everybody who is interested in that, that this is a framework of different repositories where you can find a lot of software which is already re available and you are more than welcome to use it as well as also contribute in developing it. Are there any uh, direct questions to David from the audience? You are allowed to speak out directly if you want to do so. If this is so far not the case, then I'm made the presenter, uh, Martina, the presenter, and uh, we can move forward to the next presentation and then keeping the time for the panel discussion at the end. Martina, the floor is yours. Thanks, Niels. So my name is Martina Stockhauser from the German Climate Computing Center. We also host, what we are a partner in the IPCC Data Distribution Center. And I'm here with my colleague Stefan Kindermann, who is the techni technician of us too. Um, I'm really grateful for David to set the scene that well, so I can just um, keep on and shift the view towards the climate data, or to be more precise, climate um, future projection data. Um, if we talk about the latest um, modeling data for the uh, climate's future. Then we come across the coupled model intercomparison project, phase six, or in short, CMIP6. This is a project of the World Climate Research Program. It's jointly coordinated by the CMIP panel, a scientific panel, and the WGCM infrastructure panel, um, where I'm a member of as well. Um, David has already introduced the Earth System Grid Federation, so that's our data dissemination infrastructure. There are additional components around the CMIP6 infrastructure. One is the compute services, but there are documenting services like ESDoc and the data citation service, and we have a PID service for data identification. The main funders you see on the right are in Europe, um, 
through ISENES and the Department of Energy. The NCI in Australia is a smaller partner. CMAP6 has developed or uses several standards. Some are ESGF specific, but um, getting to the more standardized um, uh, meter data and data, which we use, we use the NIT-CDF-CF standard. The, there are a lot of data infrastructure file naming conventions. We have a controlled vocabulary, for instance, and there are some international standards used by the different components. So data site metadata for the citation service, we have several RDA um, standards there. Um, in terms of infrastructure, um, David has already introduced um, WPS and Birdhouse. So we use that for the compute services as well as we contribute to the development. Um, other standards are PIT profiles, which is an RDA uh, standard. Schema.org is part of the citation service. But ESGF still has several specific, um, ESGF specific, you cannot call it standards, but we use it for several projects. And there is ongoing work towards uh, international standards like Stack API support or OGC catalog conformance. So you could say um, CMIP6 is fairly well standardized and it's developed um, as uh, a cooperation between scientists and infrastructure experts. If we move from the global information to regional, I have to mention the coordinated regional downscaling experiment. It's also a project of the WCRP. I just want to highlight the differences to CMIP. So Cortex is coordinated by a pure scientific um, panel, the science advisory team, and it reuses the infrastructure developed for CMIP6 to a certain extent, not completely, not all components, and not by all domains. I don't want to go too much into detail, but you could say that Cortex is a bit less standardized, but there's ongoing work towards a harmonization with the CMIP standards, and that's also reflected in the Cortex representative we have now in the web. Moving one step further, coming to the climate services and sectorial information, then you open up the floor to very different standards which are developed in the domains. Um, there is a network among climate services. Um, it's more a collaboration network which is focusing on the content of climate services rather than on the technical side. And you have to deal with different platforms, disseminating data, different climate service providers. And in terms of standardization, then you have to go back towards the main standards which grant interoperability. And for data metadata, I would just um, bring in the FAIR digital objects concept here. And infrastructure standards, which are important, are, of course, the OGC Open Web Standards, SEC API, but also W3C provenance standard, PIT profiles, and um, the relations between these FAIR digital objects. I've given some examples of, for climate services here on the right, which are relying on CMAP6 or Cortex data. Some of them also use parts of the ESGF infrastructure, for instance, the ESGF search API. So in essence, we need FAIR digital objects, and I would include uh, FAIR services as um, digital objects here. So we need for the interoperability these FAIR digital objects, and that need to be based on well-maintained international standards. If I move towards the um, decision making, then there is a layer in between, which is the quality assessment. As a policy advisor is not an expert in every discipline of climate um, research. He relies on trust into the organization providing the data or providing the climate service. And I would say that this trust is built on two components. One is a scientific quality review that's accessible, and the second is the traceability of results. And in that 
sense, we need to include or incorporate the scientific quality review into the service development. And secondly, to provide tools to analyze the provenance relations. Um, one example here are pit graphs. Putting the IPCC assessment report into the picture, IPCC is especially strong in this scientific review. So there's an established transparent scientific review process built into these assessment cycles. A new development for the AR60 port report, which was led by the IPCC Working Group 1 TSU Technical Support Unit, and which was supported by the Data Distribution Center partners and TG Data, was to bring in fair guidelines for the IPCC. This combines more or less the existing review process with fair data standards. So in essence, I would say trust is built on scientific review and the traceability of key results. And if we move into the future, maybe 10 years from here, when the CMAP7 data will be available and disseminated through um, data portals, climate services, then what we need to trace back the decisions of the past or more, which will be parsed in 10 years, then we need to preserve the core fair digital objects. I don't think we will be able to preserve every data set, but the core data sets like those underpinning the results of the IPCC report. And that is the function of the Data Distribution Center, the DDC, to preserve these data sets on the long term, which are underpinning the key findings of the report. And <clears throat> The concept behind the long-term preservation is not connected to FAIR principles, but more to the trust principles. So having a traceability, having an institution which is responsible, responsible for refocusing towards new user requirements and doing the technology uh, updates which are uh, required on the long-term. So in essence, to keep the data FAIR on the long-term and so in essence, we need to preserve the fair digital objects, and this includes core infrastructure components on the long term to have a sustainable traceability of decisions. So in summary, decisions are based on more and more on climate research data and not to that extent on reports anymore um, due to the climate services. We need both infrastructure and data, both are essential. We also need a fair digital object framework, which is based on international standards to enable interoperability. For trust, which is underpinning the, the decisions or decision making, we need to add scientific reviews and the traceability of results. And this traceability of results has to be available on the long term, and that needs a long term preservation of the fair digital objects and the core infrastructure. And the last point I want to make here is that the credit for this long term preservation and infrastructure maintenance is missing at the moment. It's hidden uh, and not visible. So we need a system to give credit to those institutions. And in my view, I'm looking forward to the discussion, all five points are important and need to be integrated into the fair climate service development. So I'd like to stop here, give it back to Niels. Right. Thanks a lot, Martina. That, that was an, an, an ex excellent uh, presentation. And I, I already learned quite a lot of things. Then I would like to open the floor to the audience and that we have time for one or two questions. If there's something in the, if somebody would like to ask something, feel free to do that now. If this is not the case, I would like to ask you, Martina, can you tell a bit more about the digital objects? That is, I think, something which is very interesting 
and um, yeah that, that's it, yeah. okay i i will try i'm not the expert on that so that's an initiative in the research the rda the research data alliance and what they introduce is a concept of having um bundles of um objects so the object contains in the in the core the data or software so some digital objects then a layer of metadata and a layer how to access it and so that's why they t they call it fair digital objects so there's a lot of ongoing work in that um, aspect in RDA and I think they have also funded founded an fair initiative I can look it up and and post the link into the the chat okay excellent great I made uh, Max delay the presenter so that he can continue thanks a lot Martina and that yeah I was made I made quite a lot of notes and then we will have a, a nice discussion after the presentation for that thanks a lot Martina and Max the floor is yours okay thanks uh Nils I'm sharing the screen can you see it yes all right um greetings everyone I'm going to take an end-to-end -end view on climate services really with an emphasis on supporting capacity development in um, developing countries through strengthening the operational exchange of um, data, but also of products as part of the implementation of the global framework for climate services. So, so I advance it here. Um, as you may know, there uh, is an institutional architecture that supports all of the national meteorological and hydrological services in the world, and it has two layers. There's global uh, producing centers, which are the big modeling centers, but they also um, construct large data sets. And then um, there's the regional climate centers, which are uh, in sub-regions around the world, and they are also um, formally designated WMO entities, meaning they have operational responsibilities just like the, the national centers and the global centers do. And so this infrastructure, which was really set up for um, weather forecasting, uh, is now being expanded to cover climate time scales. So I'm gonna work my way through this diagram starting from the bottom. You see the, um, the range of time scales that we would um, be dealing with in a, in a climate context from historical all the way through to climate change projections. And then at the national level, as I'll come back to, there are observations of course, but there is also historical data uh, data which has been rescued um, that is uh, very important for climatological applications as well as the ongoing observations and, and the data management responsibilities that the, the MET services have. But also the meteorological services are, are in, in, um, engaged with the client, I guess you could say, and therefore uh, they play a very important role in demand identification. What are, what are the tailored products uh, coming out of these different time scales that would be needed for high priority uses in their countries. Then moving up through the diagram, the regional level, those regional climate centers that I mentioned have an important role in pulling together regional data sets and eventually those find their way into the, um, the observational data sets that are maintained at the global level, which are usually complemented with reanalysis and, and satellite observations and so on. Then moving over to the right-hand side of the diagram, the big modeling centers are, are producing seasonal climate forecast out, um, output, model output fields, or of course the climate change projections. And these can be optimized at the regional level in a variety of ways so that when um, they come down to the countries again, the countries can do this uh, value added and empirical calibration and also developed end use specific indexes, uh, indicators, predictands that can be used to, to inform decisions. 
So um, this schematic is what is now actually being implemented on sub-regional scales, meaning um, you can think of West Africa, East Africa, Southern Africa, the Pacific, and so on, Caribbean, et cetera. So there was a very important development, I think, from the point of view of the, um, you know, the, the conversation that we're having in this session about uh, it, it was a um, decision taken at the uh, extraordinary World Meteorological Congress that took place in October that on a unified data policy that says WMO members shall provide on a free and unrestricted basis um, the data that are needed to seamlessly and accurately predict weather, water, and climate and environmental conditions. And then there's a, a should provide, which is recommended data um, that should be, you know, that, that the members should exchange on a free and unrestricted basis. And then the the kind of the the, the very um, clever part about this policy is that um, the details on what's considered core and such, uh, what's considered recommended aren't contained in the policy itself, but rather those get updated on a regular basis within the WMO technical regulations, which is a, a less onerous process than getting a, a Congress decision. So this is a, this is a very important development, I think, from the from the fair uh, point of view. So um, going back to the bottom of that diagram that I showed previously, a lot of this data comes from station observations and upper air observations taken by countries, and yet um, from a survey that was done a few years back, we know that 25% um, of the countries don't have a climate data management system to store all of those observations. 19% um, are using spreadsheets, some have developed their own CDMSs, um, half of them have operational issues and half of them would like to change the climate data management system. So there are problems in, in this operationalization or, or, or you know, sort of kinks in the process that need to be addressed. And when we look on the right hand side of this diagram, you can see what this does to the reporting of that data into the global um, system. There are countries which are, are you know, half of, of their observations are, are correct and on time um, in the orange and in the red and, and the yellow, the, uh, the orange to the yellow is, is the sort of 50 to 80 percent bracket. So um, there's a lot of work to be done on the ground to try to get the data really flowing as this policy um, requires. So um, the way this is being organized is to address these types of, of kinks and gaps is using the regional climate outlook forums. And you see all their acronyms here. They basically cover the surface of the earth now. And these, as people may know, were set up um, 25 years ago to issue consensus seasonal forecasts. But increasingly, they're being used as kind of coordination platforms to provide to, first of all, to convert the forecasting systems to objective methods that don't require um, so many activities and meetings, but are rather it's a more automated process with assessed skill. And then also so that we can figure out where these needs are um, to get the data into climate data management systems, to get it uh, to be exchanged through the WMO Information System 2.0, which has a, a flexible data and metadata standard that um, will accommodate some of those that are already mentioned. And this will allow that, um, that circuit diagram that I showed earlier to actually start to move um, in a more automated and, and less uh, with less uh, sort of human intervention and, and manual labor. So uh, I'm going to switch now from the, the data side to the services side. And um, I'll just use the RCOFs as an example. They have been issuing basically a one-size-fits-all percile rainfall uh, probability forecast now for those 25 years. And so what we've started doing in some of the uh, leading subregions is started a service delivery track which identifies what are some priority products and services that are needed across a sub-region, what are the specifications for those products, what other data is needed to, to prepare those products, and then to set up the country-level service delivery channels, deliver them, and assess the socioeconomic benefits. And then on the system operationalization track, 
through the regional climate forums, um, those products can be brought online, developed on a regional scale so that the wheel doesn't have to be reinvented in every single country. And then the regional climate centers can support the countries to, to um, issue those products on a regular basis as part of their standard uh, set of outputs. Just it wouldn't be daily weather forecasts, it would be seasonal forecasts of various kinds or historical data that could be used for different kinds of decisions. So um, without trying to do an exhaustive catalog, these types of products would also be exchanged through the WMO information system. Um, and we have many examples of these tailored products now, heat wave health warnings for informing um, different heat wave responses. Um, this is inflow into a reservoir using seasonal predictions. That's the gray bands on the left, the white bands are observed. So this is this is skill, uh, skillful information that the reservoir operators can use to adjust the operating rules in the reservoirs to, to optimize the um, water allocation. And then um, even on the on the ground level, you know, last mile, without uh, getting into forecasting, you can use historical climate data and some basic soil and um, crop information in, in a simple crop model with on the ground observations. And you can see on this slide, there's been something close to 20,000 farmers involved in this, and and the yields are up 20%, and the the savings are are up. So um, there's you know really demonstrated benefits that can help sustain these processes once you capture the socioeconomic benefits from the use of the products. So I'm going to end on one last slide because it kind of relates to some of the things that have been already discussed. On Tuesday this week, we launched a WMO, that is, with the Green Climate Fund, a set of tools and methods to help countries develop climate science information as part of their proposals for climate investments. And this can be proposals to the Green Climate Fund, but it can also be to any other climate financing entity. And um, the tools basically consist of CLIMPACT, which is a way of calculating 70 different um, climate indices from uh, historical daily temperature and precipitation data. And these are, are indexes that are known to be associated with impacts in different climate sensitive sectors like agriculture and health and water resources and so on. And then on the projection side, the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological uh, Institute has put together a climate information platform that gives a very nice interface for users um, to generate out, uh, outputs of indicators for anywhere in the world from CMIP 6, uh, no, sorry, CMIP 5 and Cordex. So, um, and then there's a methodology that, that helps, uh, you know, the users to, to work through how to use these uh, resources in order to do a climate analysis as a basis for identifying some climate actions. So, I mentioned this because A, it's, it's, um, it's relevant for today's, um, it's uh, the, the discussion we're having, but also because this will lead to a lot of financing in these countries through these projects to enhance the systems and services uh, in the countries. Um, it's not just an analysis, it's the entry point into getting a, uh, a project funded that, that can help the countries um, move up um, in terms of their capacities to deliver services. So, um, Niels, I'll stop there. Yeah. Well, excellent. Thanks a lot, um, Mark Zilli, for, for that um, impressive uh, presentation. And that was, you know, a very nice uh, addition to the things what we have heard from uh, David and Martina. Um, I took the chance also to make a bit of an advertisement because it was it's very much related to what you're talking about in the last slide. Is the Climate Change Services Pilot, which is hosted, which is now launched from uh, from OGC, and we are currently still in the phase of searching for uh, sponsors, and then uh, defining the, uh, the the scopes and all the things what you were mentioning, except the technical kind of pain points, which are currently still um, there, and can then be tackled in this in this search pilot. If you have if you are interested uh, to get more information on that, then feel free of. You know, 
Um, we have a bit of uh, time, so for um, one or two questions, direct questions to Marcus Delay. Uh, by opening the floor to the audience. Everybody is still too shy. And um, so then um, the, the two, uh, two things what, uh, what uh, I uh, realized uh, very nicely that is uh, your ideas of that you're having the developing countries in mind, that which is one of the points or the strong uh, advantages that we currently have when uh, climate information services are uh, sticking to fair standards because fair is the a means accessible and that means also you should have an, ac an access even if the local infrastructures are maybe not so strong so the the bandwidth is is low or uh, the uh, the computers don't have a huge huge capacity or then also maybe it's a, a matter of uh, lack of knowledge of how to how to handle the the, the data so that that's a very nice aspect and the second one I, I had been I was following a bit the the discussions in um, last year where WMO were talking about the unified policy data policy and I'm very happy that this is moving into that direction and that data are better available and, and open. I have a question to you uh, Max uh, when we're now moving or to the uh, European services, um, you were talking about the global ones, and uh, can you tell us that where are they actually hosted, and how much are they related to the uh, data distribution centers of the IPCC, which has Martina, uh, which has been presented by Martina, or then related to the Copernicus services, which will be presented in a couple of minutes? Yeah, you're speaking specifically of the CMIP5 and Cordex information? As well as observation, satellite images, whatever you, you would like to stress out. Yeah, so um, the historical data, importantly, is preferentially from surface stations observations taken by the countries themselves. And this is why I emphasize these um, national climate data management systems, because uh, you know, if a country were to have uh, a 30 or, or longer record, I mean, some of these stations have been operating continuously even for 100 years, uh, you have a great deal of information about um, the climate because you see, you see trends and variability in it. Um, so that, that's a tremendous resource. And it's um, a lot of that data, and when I say a lot, I mean I, I venture to say most of it is not accessible globally. It, it's still, if it's anywhere, it's on servers or even on paper still um, at the Met services. So um, the, that, that native data is, is really an important part of um, having a, a good handle on, on what the climate is doing in your country for um, starting to look at what actions you need to take. The um, CMIP 5 and um, Cortex data, I don't know exactly, you know, where SMHI, how they process it, but it, it just, it's the same um, CMIP 5 and Cortex data that, that IPCC uses and everybody uses it. I think they've just built a, a nice interface so that you can, um, as a, I mean, it, it's a, it, it's not a, uh, a black box. I mean, it really isn't. It requires expert assistance to to use these uh, the, these data. Um, but uh, the interface is very friendly from the user's point of view. They, uh, if they're interested in in um, a particular uh, set of hydrological indices, for example, they can find them very easily, and they can generate the scenarios for um, different time scales in the future, and then they can um, see the degree of model on disagreement and therefore uncertainty in the projection. So most of the value added of, the, of this climate information platform is really on the user interface and the, the, pro, the, you know, the sort of the analyses that it generates. The, I think they're just drawing the, the data itself from the wherever it's resident, the SEMA 5 and Cortex um, data centers. 
Excellent. Perfect. Good. I guess what we will move uh, forward to the <coughs> to the uh, 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 move forward to the uh, to the um, to, to, to the European services, and then here, but the speakers might can also draw the the links to the to WMO and to the your your portals and the climate information systems from the, the global perspective. Are there any more questions currently? Then, if this is not the case, I'm handing over to Angel. Can you? Uh, yes, here here you are. Okay, then I. <coughs> Right. So, Angel, you are a presenter. You can show your screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Perfect. So, good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Angel Lopez, and I'm here on behalf of the Climate Data Store uh, team at ECMWF. Uh, I will in, be presenting in here the, the Copernicus and Atmosphere uh, data stores. Wait, sorry. Yeah, uh, in order to see the scene, uh, I will probably you, most of you are already familiar with uh, Copernicus, but let me in, introduce briefly or remind what is the Copernicus. Uh, Copernicus is the European Union Earth Observation Program. And it combines satellite observations and in situ measurements. Uh, and then there is a set of services that transforms this raw data into value added geographical information products. And the ECMWF uh, has been entrusted to implement two of these services, which are the climate change service and the atmosphere uh, monitoring uh, service. Uh, more in detail, the climate change uh, service uh, provides uh, information to in increase the knowledge base and support for climate adaptation, adaptation and mitigation uh, policies. And we offer a wide set of products from observation, reanalysis, seasonal forecasts, or climate model uh, simulations. When the atmosphere monitoring, so-called CAMS, uh, provide information related to air pollution and health, solar energy, greenhouse gases, and climate forcing uh, all over the world. Well, uh, the data store, or the so-called uh, data stores, are online, open, and free services which support the implementation of both services the climate what is called the climate data store and CAMS, which is called the atmosphere uh, data store both uh, share the the same uh, infrastructure even when they are running uh, different in instances we also share uh, the teams which are behind the system so we have a common uh, devops uh, team operating and improving the the system we also have a uh, user support which is behind all the, the functionalities and providing support uh, to user and other teams which are involved in, in supporting all the infrastructure and also we share all the operational tools to uh, monitor the the, the the system in order to guarantee that the system is open and well functioning uh, for the users accessing it these uh, data stores are in continuous uh, evolution in terms of uh, functionality, uh, the content that we offer, and also the number and diversity of users that uh, came to, to use it. Um, just focusing and to give an overall picture of uh, the current status of, uh, of these both services, the Climate Data Store, for example, uh, we have more than 100,000 registered users, uh, more than 1,500 1, users on daily basis using the, the, the system, retrieving around 75 petabytes per day in the form of more than half million uh, requests. And if you came to visit our catalog, you will find um, more than 100 close to 120 data sets uh, more than 20 public applications that allow you to have a more detailed view 
uh, of the data uh, interactive uh, application and we also offer some application through the climate adapt uh, platform uh, in the atmosphere data store which uh, started in operation a little bit later not the cams but the atmosphere data store um, itself uh, there are more than 6,000 registered users and on daily basis there is more than 150 users delivering two terabytes of data in the form of more than 30,000 uh, requests and if you came to the catalog you will see more uh, around 12 catalog uh, entrances in, in there here you have the link and then we can share in the in the chat the access to these two platforms well, uh, the infrastructure that we have commented that, that is shared by the two uh, data stores, uh, in a nutshell, uh, what we provide is the simple and consistent and harmonized interface in the form of, of a user interface when the user can discover, play with the catalog. And, but we also offer the API, we offer a um, toolbox editor with uh, allowed to create more advanced functionality on top of the data but we also offer our catalog to be harvested by others uh, via standard uh, services but in the in the back end uh, what we aim is to have a robust uh, system uh, we implement quality of service rules in order to to control uh, the access to the system we try to be as more interoperable as possible we want to be scalable in order to cope with the, the, the higher demand of the of the system we try to automatize uh, at maximum and to, we try to monitor in order to guarantee that the system is accessible and well functioning uh, 24 per 7. Uh, we also offer different functionalities so we allow to users to discover data to retrieve data to process data and to also to visualize the, the data so just to go through all the different uh, components in the infrastructure and once are we start with uh, different data suppliers out there which uh, provide a uh, data and in order to bring this data into our system we have put in place uh, what we call the adapters which allow us to to interact with all diversity of uh, data suppliers one of uh, one example of an uh, adapter is the, the the interaction to retrieve cmix6 data in the um, through the cds by using wps but it has been mentioned um, before we have another adapter to interfere with the our mars archive system at ecmwf and and others so we we evolve adapter basis on on requirements there is another important component which is the the, the what we call the, the 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 broker and this broker which allow is to to manage internally all the process of this request to to connect the Oh. Everything is frozen. Okay, we lost him. That's a pity. I don't know if he's waking up. We take the uh, presentation. Okay, we lost Angel. That's uh, that happens <laughs> in in virtual sessions. It's uh, I hope he will uh, he will recover uh, soon. And I guess we are then straightforward moving to Vincent. Uh, I will make you a presenter and hope we will get back to Angel in a bit. Sorry, no, that was the... 
sur le plaidoyer par la vulgarisation de l'agroécologie. Et nous avons intégré eh, ces organisations et que nous travaillons ensemble pour la promotion de l'agroécologie. La preuve en est que nous avons organisé. That was the wrong one. <laughs> yeah. Seems. Okay. Okay. Can you see my slides? It's just uh, the white screen for the moment. Oh, why is see, see your posed app? Uh, let, let me retry. Dancing like before. I don't, I don't know whether it does this. No. Um, try again. Yes, here we go. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> sorry for this. Uh, and we are not in the same uh, country with uh, Angel. Uh, I'm located in Germany now. So uh, I don't know what's happening in, in the UK. So anyway, our, <clears throat> our two presentations are really joined in the sense that we are both speaking about <clears throat> CAMS and C3S, two of the Copernicus services. Uh, Angel, as you've seen, half uh, is speaking about uh, the distribution side of our uh, and it will complement on the distribution side of the geospatial information that we are producing. And I will be talking more about the production side, where the fair aspects are also very, very important. So what we produce uh, in, in, in C3S, uh, it will really be mentioned by Matt, uh, are, in, are a number of products, particularly reanalysis and our Last uh, product is uh, called ERA5. It's uh, the weather and, and key parameters for uh, uh, over the last 70 years. And uh, so that's the image on top. Combining lots of satellite and in situ observations with weather. Yeah. To provide a, a full data set, we, data set we, we call them maps with no gaps. Uh, over, over the 70 last years. And from there, uh, as uh, Andrei introduced, uh, we can develop applications uh, or services uh, which are targeting different things. Uh, two example, one in the bottom left is uh, what we use to issue every month uh, our climate anomalies. So comparing uh, the past months with the same months over uh, past period, uh, 91, 2020. Uh, and the other application which is highlighted is an application for uh, hydrology and looking at precipitation and, uh, and uh, hydrology uh, for the potential to, uh, to, to generate hydropower uh, for different countries and different uh, scenarios uh, for, the, for, 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 for the future. So C3S equipped with the climate data store is, is an engine uh, behind lots of uh, different climate services. CAMS uh, is similar. Uh, CAMS is uh, looking at atmospheric composition. So part of it is in the realm of uh, climate services. Uh, this part are uh, emissions of greenhouse gases. So currently we have a, a number of uh, products already. Uh, one which is uh, shown on this slide is about uh, emissions of CO2 uh, from wildfires. Uh, so as you uh, I've heard probably in the news, uh, wildfires have been very extreme, in particular in the Arctic uh, this year. Also, for those of you uh, in, in Europe, uh, you've uh, seen the very big fires around the Mediterranean uh, as well. So it's part of what we uh, monitor in camps, again, using uh, satellite observation and modeling to estimate these, these emissions. And the point of the bottom of the slide is that even if the trend is uh, increase or, and sometimes uh, extreme increase uh, in some regions, overall the, the global trend is a decrease of uh, wildfire emissions uh, of CO2 due to a decrease in the tropical, uh, in the tropical area. So it's really uh, important to, uh, to, to monitor uh, the climate system uh, in all its dimensions and all across, uh, all across the world. The way we work, and, and uh, Angel had a slide uh, slightly similar, is uh, basically inherited from uh, 40 years plus of numerical weather prediction. 
So we acquire uh, satellite observations. Uh, currently, in our case at ECMWF, it's about 80 different instruments. We acquire in situ uh, observation, mostly from regulatory network uh, or meteorological network, and we process that with global and or regional systems to deliver to our, uh, to, to our users. So that was the world, I would say, up to uh, five, six years ago. And the new element uh, is really an increasing number of Internet of Things and socioeconomic data that become increasingly important uh, to uh, deliver our services, uh, of course, going into the area of impacts, but also uh, more fundamentally. And that's the example I would like to take. We've really made uh, giant strides on this uh, with the case of the COVID. The question being, uh, are you able uh, with uh, observations, with uh, traffic counts, with energy production statistics, to estimate on a daily basis uh, how the emissions uh, have been during the COVID period, and especially the lockdown period, focusing here in, uh, on, on Europe. Uh, it's a work that was done by the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. To, uh, to compare these emissions that we estimate to uh, the ones that would have happened otherwise, because you know that emissions vary as a function of uh, weather, uh, the energy demand, for instance, is very different. Uh, so you need to, uh, if you want to make a difference and assess, in that case, the, the effect of, uh, of COVID, you really need to compare to a business as usual, a realistic business as usual case. And in order to do that, you not only need uh, I would say the typical satellite observation, the typical uh, regulatory uh, observations, uh, air quality in that case, uh, the pollutant is uh, NO2, uh, but also all these socioeconomic data that comes uh, in that case, there were lots of traffic data that we could, uh, that we could get uh, from uh, Google and Apple in particular. So that's already, already there. So the, 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 the big challenge that we have, especially in the context of, of COP, is to uh, know uh, how our emissions of CO2, but also of methane and a few greenhouse gases, are, are changing. Currently, these estimates uh, lag in time because uh, it needs time for countries to report uh, these emissions. Uh, very often, there is no detailed special information because it's based on uh, fossil fuel consumption. And uh, more importantly, or as importantly, uh, there is very little temporal uh, information about how these emissions are done. However, uh, it, it makes uh, some difference, uh, of course, on the, on the impact. So there is a big challenge to uh, be faster about uh, and to, uh, to, to, to know about these, these emissions. And that's where uh, uh, we have a big initiative as part of, uh, of Copernicus, but also coordinated at scale with uh, the WMO and in particular the IGIS initiative and with the CIOS regarding the satellite part in particular, uh, it's to, uh, to have a new uh, capabilities uh, from space. So in Europe, uh, it's this uh, CO2 emission that will be designed to, uh, to monitor with super high precision uh, CO2, uh, but also uh, networks like ICOS uh, for, for, uh, for, for, for CO2 to uh, develop a system, uh, so-called in inverse modeling system, to estimate the uh, anthropogenic emissions of, of CO2. So that's very well. And what we think is that actually there is a, a huge potential for considering more data than these uh, we'd say traditional sources uh, in the form of local sensors, uh, activity indicators, as I mentioned, traffic counts, energy, etc., flights, and social economic uh, data as well. And for that, of course, uh, fair principles are essential because otherwise uh, that can be a completely inextricable uh, situation to have to deal with uh, dozens of manufacturers. If you think only of the boom in uh, CO2, in cheap low-cost CO2 sensors uh, due to COVID uh, and, and the number of companies that have emerged, it's, it's completely intractable with, uh, uh, with, uh, without uh, some, some, some principle for sharing uh, and discovering the data. So our, uh, our plan uh, is called uh, CO2 monitoring and verification support capacity. So basically the two branches are observation of atmospheric CO2 that will come uh, through satellite, through EC2. Uh, the other branch is what we already know and from that uh, it will include uh, emission inventory in the traditional sense, but also uh, 
the estimates of the uh, emissions from industry, from traffic, from all the uh, data that we can get uh, out of the IoT and, and, and other type of sensors to process that and deliver uh, estimate of the emissions serving uh, different uh, user categories, so becoming a, a typical uh, climate services like, uh, like the other ones. So we have already some uh, examples. Uh, we have research projects that are ongoing to, to go in this direction. Uh, we have nice uh, results in particular uh, on the left uh, showing our inverse modeling capacity uh, for emissions of the AFOLU sector, so the uh, agriculture, forestry and other land use uh, category, where we compare uh, what we infer from satellite observations and ground-based observation. And it's uh, looking quite similar for big countries uh, in, the, in the period where we have uh, satellite observations, so that's a good sign. And it's already my, my last uh, slide with, uh, with the message. The first one in the context of COP is that, uh, is this uh, basic statement that one can only manage what one can measure. And so evidence-based uh, and uh, data-driven uh, decision-making is really vital to uh, effectively address the, the climate crisis. So the fair principles are core to CAMS and C3S, uh, both on the input, so what I've just shown here, uh, focusing on the example of uh, emissions of CO2, but also on the outputs. And I hope that uh, Angel will be able to uh, show you the, the end of his, uh, his presentation uh, side. So uh, it needs to be end-to-end. And uh, the, uh, in the example of monitoring uh, human emission of greenhouse gases, uh, it is most probably, I think, in order to succeed, it is uh, needed to supplement, uh, I would say, traditional approach, uh, that is the ones with numerical weather prediction heritage, with new, uh, more varied, more complex, more heterogeneous data sets and indicators uh, that we need to be able to, to harness. And why we need fair principle is it in particular because uh, in order to base decision, uh, we have a need for uh, traceability uh, from the end product, which um, most users will, uh, will, uh, will use and take, but up to the input data so that uh, for the use in policy context, it is possible to trace back uh, where this data has been uh, coming, uh, coming from. A side benefit of uh, this activity uh, and, and making all these uh, streams uh, more fair, uh, it's that it will open up access to these new data streams. Uh, it's still, uh, I've shown you an example on COVID. It was quite a difficult task for some. There are also some data streams that we couldn't uh, get access to. So uh, where a data policy permits, uh, New, new standards uh, and fair principle will allow really to uh, unlock uh, access uh, of this data uh, to uh, wider user audiences. And, and, and that's very important for producing products like uh, CO2 emissions, but that's even more important for uh, assessing impacts. I thank you for your attention. Great, thanks a lot, Vincent Henry. This is uh, yeah, very, very nice. Sorry for the difficulties with uh, with the previous uh, uh, presentation. We will continue in a, in a bit with Angel uh, Alos, and um, I will as well uh, give give um, one or two questions to the audience. If you would like to to have, if you would like to ask something directly to Vincent Henry. In parallel to that, also please feel free uh, if you are too shy to speak out or uh, the microphone is maybe not working. So there is the chat. You can always type in some uh, information also in the chat, or questions or yeah or information if you would like to share something with uh, with. Uh, Vincent Henry, I have a, I have a clear I have a question um, uh, directly because we were we we were listening to uh, Max Delay uh, with the climate information platform. Can you uh, say where, where is the difference between the Copernicus services or also the relations between the Copernicus services and the WMO uh, climate information platform? So there may be Angel is better place to me to, to replace. Uh, what I can say is a, is a generic element. So Copernicus is a European program with a full free and open data policy. Uh, so that it's not uh, it's powered by Europe, but it's for the benefit of uh, of the world. Of course, we we work uh, in general in the framework of uh, the WMO. It's true for climate services, and it's true as well for greenhouse gases and IGIS. Uh, so so basically, uh, I would consider uh, 
our contribution to, to Copernicus as a contribution to the to the global uh, to, to the global activity under the framework. So we may be uh, like a prototype or pilot or uh, front runners uh, to uh, to to help and train the group, test uh, test out things and and make it happen. So show that uh, it's not just plans and things that may happen in the future. It's happening today. Uh, and yeah, I think that's the, the type of uh, connections that, that we have with, uh, with WMO. Of course, uh, being at ECMWF, we have a very long tradition of working with WMO and with this task that we do on behalf of the uh, European uh, Union, uh, there is no change. Uh, so there is not a special agenda of uh, Europe and we want to be uh, shy on our things. Uh, it's, it's a contribution of Europe to, uh, to, to do monitoring the environment and, and, and climate. So I don't know, maybe Andre, you want to, to comment more precisely on the platform on, or Max, you will give. Well, I was just going to say that we see it the same way, uh, Vincent Henri. The, the C3S has been a really a, a kind of a pillar of the global framework for climate services from the standpoint you mentioned of having uh, an actually functioning um, set of resources that people can draw on globally. And so um, it's one of the pillars really of the global system. And then what, as I explained, what we're trying to do is increasingly capacitate the countries to add value um, you know, of their own and also to be able to use the tools more effectively to support policies and decisions. Yeah. Uh can you hear me? Because I, I don't know when, at which point I've been uh, disconnected. Sorry, you know the technology fails when, <laughs> when uh, this problem. Okay, uh, no, I will just to add. I think Vincent Rie and Max are have already responded. But just from the technical perspective, it's just to say that the, our data stores aim to to provide the entry point for different data and services in order to facilitate all these um, these connectivities and we are open to evolve um, the platform in order to facilitate this including the wmo in order to be compatible with the, with them and with uh, any any other right yeah thanks a lot Angel, i made you a presenter so you can give it a try again and then continue with uh, with your presentation, you dropped off uh, somewhere around where you are having the uh, the production line of the uh, the data store, the, the graphic of uh, how data are being transformed into information. Uh, okay. Point. But now having the insight from Vincent Henry, so the, about the services, it is very much uh, interesting as, uh, to to see also how the technique is working behind it. Okay, can you try to share again? Um... Mm, you are still there. You are a presenter. You should do it. Otherwise, I can do it on my side. Yeah, probably. It's... No. Uh, well, let me try one more time. Here we go. Yeah, but I think you you don't see what. Uh... Yeah, I I think it's better if you if you do. Okay. Yes. Here. Here we go. All right, this was more or less the point where you dropped off and um, the, st the, the floor is yours to continue on that on your side. Okay, sorry, I don't want to repeat myself and I don't know where I've been disconnected. So I think I was just saying that our aim here with the data store is to create a simple interface for the users and for even for the for the provider with to interact with the system, but also a robust uh, backend in order to 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 be able to manage the the system to be scalable, to automatize uh, things as maximum. And what we aim at the end is to offer access to data and compute uh, capabilities. So for discover the data, retrieve it, process it, and, and visualize it. So uh, the whole picture is we there is a, a 
set of data uh, suppliers out there that we want to, to offer this channel to, to, to connect with them. For this, we have put in place one component, what we call the adapters. Uh, one example of this adapter I was uh, referring to is the WPS we have to interact with the CMIXIS uh, data, but also the adapter that we have to interact with our ECMWF Mars uh, archive and many others. So we are able to evolve uh, these adapters uh, whenever it is required. We also have this internal component, which is the broker, which allow us to, to, to manage internally all the, the, the operations in the, in the system to, to dispatch the request and to, to handle them. Uh, and an important element is the, what we call the common data model. This allows us um, to combine uh, different uh, data sets. We also implement tools which allow to interact and to, to, to perform ac actions on top of this data and to articulate everything in workflows that at the end produce visual um, user um, applications. I think we can jump into the into the next one, Niels. Thanks. Yeah. So at the end, the driving principles uh, when we start creating this data store is that we wanted to do our uh, available resources the more uh, exposed as, as possible in order to facilitate the, the the users and to the communities the access to our data and services. For this, we have provide uh, different capabilities. We have the uh, user interface where you can discover our catalog, but we also offer um, our catalog to be harvested by other platforms as Wikio, Geos, and other. We also have some interaction with uh, Google to, to follow these structured data uh, principles. Uh, we also put our data in a in a DOI re registry. Uh, we also aim to to offer accessible interfaces so that the user can build um, operations and can build um, solutions on top of them. We have interfaces to discover, to learn about the products. We have APIs to, to access the the functionalities. We have the adapters to interact with different providers. We all also offer um, computing uh, capabilities. Uh, but there is an important factor to keep in mind, um, which is uh, for us is really important, is the diversity and the specificity of uh, the data formats that we manage. So we have in the CDF grid observations, but also the volume of the data that, uh, that we offer. So some of our the data set that we offer um, are petabytes of data. So it's important to put in place the, 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 the functionalities which allow to, to, to really um, subset and to do actions on top of the data before we deliver it to, to, to the users. Another important aim is the interoperability, which we put an internal interoperability in place in order to perform all this internal action on the system, but also the external interoperability with providers, as I was mentioning, but also also with uh, another uh, platform. So along the, 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 the whole uh, pipeline, we, we offer this interoperability and also it's important the reusability of the things. So we have this centrally managed repository where we have all the, 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 the code of the system, but also all the configuration of the content. This allow us to, 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 be, um, to provide our content in different, following different standard formats. So we populate from there all our catalog to be offered via CSW but we also populate all the, the structured data we need with the, all the DOI registries that we do and, and so on. And also we offer our form definition, the constraint, the licenses and, and everything uh, to be reused. Um, and also it's important, uh, we have put a lot of effort in the harmonization using naming convention, uh, thesaurus and registries and, and so on. 
Uh, next slide, please. So I think we are in a very good condition that we have a real commitment to the with the fair uh, principle. So considering that we try to harmonize, simplify, and be consistent and be reliable and with this system. So I think it has been mentioned in different presentations. So we need to put in place these capabilities to interact with all these distributed data sources, which are um, very different. Uh, so we enforce as maximum to the data providers to, to, to the use of uh, standards in order to facilitate all this integration in our system. Internally, we also make use of these FAIR principles for automatic deployments or putting in place these internal uh, compute uh, capabilities that we offer. And downstream, we also offer, uh, we take advantage of the FAIR principles, uh, offering things in a standard format, uh, providing all the, the this accessibility via the interfaces and to integrate with uh, other platforms. So examples of this we have for the data discovery, as I was mentioned, the, the CSW, also the data quality, follow OGC and ISO standards, um, data for the data access, I was mentioned the WPS that we offer. For the visualization, we, we put in place um, WMS in order to, to enrich the, the public applications, but there is a still a lot of work to, 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 to do in order to get on board all the, the more advanced OGC APIs, which is the aim of the, the evolution of the system. Next slide, please. So we are now in a, in a process to modernize the current uh, data store. So we want to evolve it into a more modern and usable and interoperable um, infrastructure. We want to continue expanding the catalog of uh, products uh, and services that, uh, that we offer. We want to bring computation even closer to the data. We want to take better advantage of all the, the, the cloud computing uh, capabilities. Uh, in order to achieve uh, or to engage with a wider user community, we need to modernize our uh, toolbox to, to make it more, more open and to reinforce the integration with uh, other platforms. So at the end, what we aim more and more is to achieve a more streamlined climate data and information flow. And on top of that, just to say that our aim is to become uh, fi fair plus, so more findable, more accessible, more interoperable, and more visible. Next slide, please. So yeah, that's all. Here you have the links to all the different platforms, uh, also Wikio, where you have access to all this functionality and also to computing um, capabilities. So thank you very much. Excellent, thank you a lot, uh, Angel. I'm glad uh, that we finally make it as well. I'm glad to, to see the rest of your your slides, and it is very very nice to see the also the prog progress. I'm that I know Copernicus now for a long time, and also the inside and how you are moving uh, inside in uh, the backend systems and getting more and more operational uh, in terms of fair principles. I would like to open the questions again for the audience and. Don't be shy, uh, ask questions also in the in the chat if you want to do so. Is there someone who would like to ask something? Yes, Nils. Yeah, hello, yes. Christian. Um, one question about uh, the CDS. Um, uh, I didn't see um, uh, inform much information about how do you uh, uh, create provenance information? How do you deal with provenance information, especially for uh, reproducibility aspects um, uh, in the creation of the products? This is a, yeah, thank you for the for the question. It's, there has been a lot of discussion in order to put in place the better way of this uh, 
provenance. It's not an easy uh, task, uh, considering that we have uh, this diversity of uh, data sets with different uh, versions. We put in place all these different tools on top of that. Uh, we allow uh, great uh, flexibility uh, for users to implement different tools and, and workflows. But even so, it's something that we are, we are putting effort, even if uh, we still have not found a, a, a perfect uh, solution. But we have all, all this uh, traceability. So we, we try to keep track record of everything, the version of the data that are used, the version of the tools, uh, how the workflow uh, has been structured, um, and this, uh, these things, which um, yeah, but uh, still there is a lot of work to be done in, in, in there. This is uh, the truth. Thanks a lot. I mean, excellent question from, from Christian Barger. Is somebody else would like to add. We have also the data centers on the call working on provenance systems. Maybe later on the in, or you can also exchange in the in the chat if you want to do that. And let's move forward to um, to the last speaker uh, at uh, Eduardo. And your presentation is here, and I'm pretty much looking forward to that. Except now we have a focus on satellite images and also building back the bridge to the UNFCCC to the uh, Paris Agreement, because we are here in the virtual pavilion for COP26. And uh, we will see again how we were, we're starting in the beginning. We said, where is actually the link between the policymakers uh, bundling up with the negotiations for the moment and our work on the technical side? And whether the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nils, and good afternoon, everyone. I am Ed Pachoro. I'm a member of the European Space Agency Climate Office, and it's my pleasure to share with you. Uh, the perspective of the ESA Climate Office on fair data principles as uh, originally defined by Mark Wilkinson and how these fair principles are playing an important role for us in meeting the needs of our climate monitoring data stakeholders. First, uh, a, a brief background to the ESA Climate Office. Next, please. Thank you, Niels. So the ESA Climate Office is the focal point of climate activities in ESA. Uh, we implement the Climate Change Initiative since 2009. It currently involves over 125 European institutions, large and small, from both private and public sector and, and over 400 scientists in the programme. The research data sets that we produce from the program uh, serve as one amongst many inputs um, from climate monitoring agencies to operational services such as uh, C3S of ECMWF, which uh, which Angel just uh, presented on. And, and indeed, I and Angel uh, and others between the ESA Climate Office and uh, C3S work closely together. Next, please. Uh, the objective of this ESA flagship program is to leverage Earth observation data sets over the last 40 years to perform the computational stitching together of data from these uh, many different EO missions uh, over time, uh, computationally applying the latest scientific thinking via algorithms uh, uh, across a, a series of geophysical parameters which we commonly uh, call in our climate monitoring community essential climate variables. So in short, into the program goes 40 years archived of EO data from um, ESA and our uh, ESA uh, members and out is, is produced a long time series quality assured uh, data products of, of climate monitoring. 
Next, please. This this is simply a big picture, a simple big picture of how the UNFCCC needs at the top for policy making, how those needs trickle down to ESA, and uh, not only ESA but but um, all uh, essentially all uh, climate monitoring agencies, uh, the overall community of, of space agencies there at the bottom. So uh, the UNFCCC set, sets the, 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 the policy making um, objectives and, and tone. Next, please. Uh, those uh, UNFCCC needs are translated into actions then by the climate, the Global Climate Observing System, GCOS, in the form of quantitative requirements for the production data uh, for about 50 geophysical um, climate indicators, which are, are commonly called, which are commonly called in our community, essential climate variables. Uh, and about half of these, which you see uh, on the right there, are measurable from space. Uh, these EC, these essential climate variables defined by GCOS are based on three criteria. They're relevant. Uh, the, in, in other words, the, the variable is critical for characterizing the climate system and its changes. Uh, feasibility, uh, observing the variable on the global scale is technically feasible using proven methods. And this is a particular advantage of, of measurements from space. And thirdly, cost effectiveness. So generating and archiving data on the variable is, is affordable. So in, in summary, the, the, the global climate observing system sets the, the rule book, the target for um, ESA and, and uh, other um, agencies uh, in, in, um, in trying to meet, in trying to create data sets which meet those targets. Uh, next, please. These um, global climate observing system actions also include actions on data management. So this is particularly relevant for, for our discussion here. Um, rather than, um, I, I, I should point out that at the top there, that those GCOS monitoring principles, um, they are, they, uh, in the in the implementation plan, they they call for uh, data management systems that facilitate access, use, and interpretation of climate data as quote essential um, for for monitoring systems such such as uh, as ours in ESA and and those of our our sibling uh, organisations in in climate monitoring, and indeed these GCOS monitoring principles were adopted at COP9 in Milan 2003, so they're, they're long-standing. These, uh, this GCOS rulebook, so to speak, also defines uh, actions on, um, on data management. And although the GCOS, interestingly, or although the GCOS implementation plan does not, def does not explicitly refer to FAIR, uh, they, the, the G, these GCOS actions are um, mappable to FAIR, and in and it also in, interestingly in the, this year when when GCOS released their climate status uh, 2021 report, it it now um, refers explicitly to to FAIR uh, data principles as as um, uh, as as an action uh, which uh, agencies, including space agencies, should should be targeting. So actually, your your in, your um, initiative, Niels and OGC, this year has been quite timely and and useful. Next slide, please. Again, ESA, we take as as is, is the case with other agencies who are producing these ECV data sets, we, um, we, we 
address the, the the implementation plan through through a series of currently 23 pa parallel projects for each of those essential uh, climate variables, but also dedicated projects which um, which directly um, meet the those GCOS data management actions. And I put there fair by proxy because interestingly through through an exercise that that you um triggered me doing this year Niels uh we at the ESA climate office we we now notice that uh those fair data principles are are mappable to the, the GCOS actions on on data next please Uh, rather than list a uh, climate change initiative uh, assets per GCOS action, I've, I've listed them here as, as how each of our, our uh, assets and activities map to FAIR. Um, I, I've learned much this year through, through the, the, the prior UNFCCC um, side regional side events with the uh, with Niels and OGC on FAIR and uh, uh, the, the FAIR data principles and the, the the reasoning behind FAIR is is, is a persuasive one I, I think uh, particularly now that uh, the global climate observing system formally recognize uh, the, the FAIR data principles through their climate uh, reports this year next please I'll finish here with uh, with some of the the lessons learned from the ESA Climate Office uh, th this year in our um, conversation with with OGC and uh, through our thinking uh, uh, our thinking around the, the the latest global climate observing uh, status report on on climate this year, which re refers to fair data. Uh, just a few points here on on what we've learned on this fair data perspective. Firstly, the, the fair data principles on infrastructure apply importantly um, to climate to the climate perspective. It, it's not as obvious perhaps as it may sound, because we found that the infrastructure developers should uh, should be part of the conversation when we're uh, in ESA uh, addressing the these fair data principles. It's use the, the 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 infrastructure developers usefully illuminate the the early challenges on uh, on how um, we're applying fair data principles, and then we can feed that information to our partners and and to OGC. Uh, and, and, and indeed, that's part of the conversation we already have with NetCDF, for example, highlighting. Um, proposed changes to to facilitate our uh, the, the use of our data products secondly on fair data principles as as we know uh, a, a applies to many different sectors um and that indeed that's one of its its many strengths from the perspective of climate monitoring um climate metadata is arguably more technically challenging than the application of fair data principles in, in other sectors, um, in the, 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 the challenge being in, in our climate data community, codifying and categorizing the many different types of climate data, that there's a huge diversity. It's not only the, the geophysical parameters across the essential climate variable uh, spectrum, but they, climate data products use different satellite data sets, different algorithms, uh, the resulting data can be projected on different grids, uh, that there are different spatial and temporal resolutions, vector versus grid based, and, and so on. So um, the, 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 um, the fair data principles uh, resonate strongly with, with the challenges we, we have on um, um on on uh producing essential climate variable data sets particularly with findable 
and accessible. So I think that there's more work that, that can be done there for, from our community. Uh, again, thirdly, the fair data principles are mappable to the Paris Agreement. Uh, so this is something we, we can uh, th discuss offline if, if it may be of interest. And, and th th this, map this mappable um, situation comes from um, bringing in, comes from ob observing both uh, the, 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 G the climate, Global Climate Observing System Implementation Plan together with uh, the, the GCOS um, state status report of, of this year. And um, lastly, uh, a, a conversational point, perhaps I, I would be, um, I would welcome thoughts from uh, from others on um, the, the potential benefit in prioritizing the fair data principles specific to climate data management. As, as we're aware, fair data principles apply across any sector and as we know that's their strengths however are there particular situations for climate data management which we may want to skew and prioritize those those fair data principles and an example might be uh, from a big data perspective um the the the, the essential climate variable data sets have a, a particular emphasis on variety and veracity quality rather than volume and velocity. So how does that bear out in how we uh, prioritize fair data principles? And of, of, of course, um, should there be a particular, a, a particular higher priority for interoperability given that there are uh, many existing climate projects across different organizations on, on climate monitoring and, and data. And th th this is in the context of um, uh, activity in, in our community accelerating uh, in, 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 in sight of uh, the, 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 the European Commission's Destination Earth program. So thank you, Niels, and I'd be happy to, to discuss or answer any questions. Excellent. Thanks a lot for that, <clears throat> for, for this uh, very nice, nice talk. Um, there is a comment from David, and I'm, maybe David, you can speak out yourself directly and give an aspect to, to add. Yeah, thanks. So, so, so add to um, make make some. I mean, get some feedback from from you on your question on on what's what's the priorities for fair or what's the opportunity to opportunities. My sense is that contrary to weather forecasts that are very tied to local uh, regions as as well as historical observations that, that come from point stations. In the future climate realm, a lot of products are global, whether it's global projections from cloud models or these remote sensing data sets. And so to me, that's where the benefits from the FAIR principles come from. I mean, there is huge potential for reuse at the local scale from those global products. And so having strong standards could help build one service once and then be reused across the world instead of of the current situation which which i'm fearing is that individual climate service centers basically reinvent the wheel and create those national climate services over and over because there has been no standard to help share those uh, i mean the initiatives from one country to the next and so this is where i think the low-hanging fruits are and thanks for your presentation Thank you, thank you, David. I, I entirely agree on on the reusability, and um, it, it's a, it's a healthy exercise to, to to go through the four I have found to go through the the, the formal fair data, data principles on on this, um, and I, I I 
would also bring into the equation, I would echo what you say and also bring into the equation what the fair data principles have to say about um, infrastructure and the how, how useful it how useful it is to have open source uh for, for that into in for, for, for such in infrastructure and 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 with that um th that would uh, i i think um uh, simplify our, our work in, in interoperability it's not just our interfaces but us uh pr producing these open source tools that, that we can share between us yeah Thanks a lot. I would like to ask all the present presenters to switch on your your camera, and then we can uh, move a bit more to a broader uh, discussion um, for the last 15 minutes. Unfortunately, Max, a delay ne needed to drop off. That was also the reason why we changed uh, slightly the uh, the agenda. Um, I would ha have some questions to him, or in particular, whether maybe I can ask it later to to everybody else. But I would like to open the the floor to uh, the the audience, and there had been already a question from Dennis, and uh, starting to answer that. But maybe it's the, uh, Dennis St uh, Stuber from uh, Meteo Cross, can you? Uh, repeat your question for everybody on the metadata standards and then we can discuss that. Okay. You... Okay, okay, sorry, sorry. Do you do you do you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, okay. I was uh, having trouble with my camera and uh, my, my, my sound. So my, my question was about the metadata uh, inside the uh, climate data store. Um, I am from Meteo France, but I work also at uh, some technical commission from WMO. And we are working working on the on a, what we call open CDMS. It's a climate data management system um, in open source for a national uh, purpose. That means that uh, uh, it's uh, on the on the land that it's not at uh, regional or our global uh, level, but really uh, in each uh, country, and uh, uh, because we know that a lot of uh, med services have a lot of troubles to manage their data in uh, in their country. So, um, so my question uh, was because we were um, uh, we are going to uh, implement the Wigos metadata model from WMO inside our system. And uh, we will try also to connect with the whole potential from Copernicus the Climate Data Store, because uh, every time I'm very impressed of uh, those capacities inside the, the Climate Data Store. And I was uh, dreaming to give the, the potential for uh, modest MET services to be able to uh, to use uh, uh, the uh, let's say the uh, the big data set and uh, the software code from uh, Copernicus and that was the uh, how to in fact my question is uh, how to to link uh, uh, for small med services and give to them the capacity to also uh, to play their uh, their role at a regional or higher level. Thanks a lot, uh, Denise. This is my first of all, I guess, a question to Angel. You can start, and then the other speakers can jump in. Well, thank you, um, Denise. Um, as I was mentioning. Um, we have uh, our infrastructure is uh, evolving. So currently uh, we provide access to in situ uh, observations, but uh, <clears throat> now we are in the process and uh, recently in order to modernize, to go into the news, this next phase. So we have launched an ITT uh, and we are now in the process of selecting the, 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 the new contractors that will evolve this platform. And one of the components that was uh, mentioned 
to be covered by the new modernization of the system is an observation repository. So we are asking uh, contractors to bring expertise in order to help us to, to build all these observation repositories based on uh, what is out there in order to better fit uh, with different uh, uh, providers and different um, standards and also building uh, supported by all the knowledge that we internally we have at uh, ECMWF. So this is a component that we are now planning to build in the in the coming future. So I think we can uh, base it on, on or starting in this presentation, we can continue our interaction and probably we can offline, we can um, take your feedback and, and be how we can evolve in that direction. Oh, yes, for us, it would be a, a great uh, interest to, to have such a collaboration for sure. And uh, you, you were talking uh, uh, about a common data model. Is, is it the one for the observation repository or? This common data there? model, <clears throat> no, it's a component that is already in there. And we try to make compatible with this common data model, all the different data sets that we integrate uh, in, our, in our catalog. Uh, it's um, an evolving uh, process or so not all the, the data sets are compatible with the CDM, and we, but we have uh, people uh, in the team working on, on make this uh, possible um, for each data set that we integrate. So th thank you very much, Angel, for your, for your <coughs> Great, excellent. Good. Um, I have seen that the <coughs> Dr. Professor Lebo uh, Barmartina was uh, switching on the the microphone do, do you would like to to ask a question okay that seems not to be the case so i'm muting him again great so then uh, are there any other questions in the audience i would like to give you the floor yes marie francois yeah. Yes, I have one. I would like to know for the panel if we can summarize uh, what are the specificities for uh, climate services to be fair. I have identified um, uh, the credit if we want to gather a lot of data, a baseline of open data from, uh, the, um, from the talk of uh, Max, um, the provenance uh, management from the question of Christian because uh, we go from a big amount of data to a uh, a smaller amount of information, but we need to manage the provenance uh, impacting this information. Um, the, the very big reusability of uh, the final information, because it would be very much value added information that would be able to be reusable, thanks to the work which has been done to identify the essential climate variables that already align a lot of interoperability work upstream. Uh, but and, and create the foundation for the reusability downstream. So I don't know if we can summarize a little bit what are the specificities uh, for a fair climate services. Great. Yes, I had a similar question, that, and uh, but now you you took that. So the the floor is open for the the speakers who would like to make a start. Yes. David, are you? Well, just just one maybe tiny point. I'd like us to think about climate products not as final data products, but as intermediate data products, as inputs to the next climate services that is going to operate on this intermediate product. And so this is where the concept of, of provenance is so and interoperability is so important because every result coming out of climate service is potentially an input to another another service. So I think like switching this perspective on climate services is really key to making sure that our workflows can work together and assemble different scientific algorithms that we may not have forethought would be used together, but that users will, will find interesting to, to like, attach. I'll stop there. Yeah, Martina. Um, maybe I can add here um, that I think the FAIR framework is a good concept to have these 
different digital objects which are fair. So we have the underlying data which needs to be fair, needs to be findable, accessible, and then it can be accessed and included in climate services. And the same is true for, for the service as a component. So we need to have it findable that you can get to it. But for the interoperability you and the reusability, you always need some attached metadata to bring meaning into it. So I think that was not so exposed here in the discussion. So provenance is one thing, but information on the object itself is also required. And I'd like to want to make one additional point, which is included in, for instance, the criteria of the fair sphere, which is the idea to cite the data, because we are talking about research data. Research data is about giving credit to those who provide it. And with the new data sets like CMIP6 also have licenses which require it. So it's, these are open licenses. It's only about giving credit for those who provided it. And I think that's also something we have to include if we make it completely fair and compliant to the criteria that the Fair Sphere uh, Initiative defined. I stop here. That's great. That that was a very very nice answer for that. Um, is, is anybody who wants to to add here on that point? Yeah, maybe, Vincent. Maybe just to I agree with all that was said. I think also in the context of climate change, there is the policy use which is very important, which puts an even greater. I, I think there is in science there is the ontology and traceability which we are all very used to uh, to do, but, but the, the policy use is a entirely, uh, um, not new, but an entirely additional set of uh, requirements because it, it gets rapidly into litigation, etc. So the need for traceability is, is not best practices, it's just a must, because then all the chain of elements that went into services, and I agree uh, with uh, I think it was David uh, saying that services are input to other services, etc. If we lose the traceability to the actual elements and data sets that went into uh, into a process, uh, it will be very difficult to have a, a credible input to, to policy deci and, and, and decision making. So, so I, I think it, in the context of the climate crisis, it's just a must. Right. I would. Yeah, we are very close to uh, to the top of the hour, and we need to stop the session. That I, I uh, my, my question that I had in mind, and that was very similar to to the one was Marie Francois was asking. Uh, I would uh, uh, ask it in a different way. So, if we if we would have the wish, uh, thinking about uh, King, uh, COP26 and then UNFCCC, and here we have the subsidiary body of uh, the scientific and technology advice. That if you would have the wish, uh, what would we give them so that they can recommend uh, to the countries? And I guess with David and Martina, uh, Vincent and Rie, um, that, that was very clearly uh, pointed out where to uh, address, uh, what to address to, to this subsidiary body so that they can move forward. And uh, that is one of the points that we wanted to make in the climate service uh, pilot that we are kind of writing an, um, uh, an, a wish list, <laughs> writing a guidebook on fair climate services, um, cl climate change services, handing them then over to uh, the UNFCCC uh, subsidiary bodies so that they can ingest that, so that they can bring that as recommendations for the uh, yeah, national or continental climate services. That was a bit of an outlook, so that's the idea. Um, uh, that was, yeah, it's one of the ideas and listening to these discussions, I think this is the right way to go. And um, with that, I need to close the sessions. It was uh, very, very nice uh, to, to, uh, to, to listen to all of that and that um, very nice bundling up and of the, the fruits of the entire year, as Eduardo already pointed out, that we had made 
several um, uh, several other uh, sessions. <clears throat> It has been recorded. We will put that into uh, on 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 the on the site, and uh, to all the audience who is there, feel very much welcome of reaching out if you would like to have more info information. And I'm pretty sure that this discussion will continue, and we are con yeah continue on working on the fair climate change services. Okay, thanks a lot for everybody, and I wish you a nice evening, morning, or whatever time zone you are. <laughs>